Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's really lovely to be here. Thank you for the opportunity, Karen, and thank you for inviting me, Jim. Um, welcome. My name is Dr. Carmel Bond. Uh, I'm just getting used to saying that because I've just been awarded my PhD, so it feels a bit weird. <laughs> And I can completely, all the experiences that you were talking about and uh, your, the other PhD student that's just, what, sorry, I've forgotten your name, Michael, all those things resonate, you know, that, um, all that, going through all that data and, oh, yeah, recruitment nightmare. Um, so, welcome. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today. I'm just going to give a snapshot overview of my PhD because it sort of gives it away. And again, at that the title completely changed towards the end of it. It was really sort of bland and boring at the start and it emerged as I went through the PhD. Um, so I did a, a discourse analysis and I looked at experiences of compassion from the perspectives of mental health nurses and from the perspectives of mental health patients. Um, um, so I did a multi-level analysis and at the start of it I looked at all the discourse around compassion including the policy discourse, government discourse. So over the last 10 to 15 years we've heard a lot about this term compassion. Um, so I'd like to share some of the doctoral research today so and in doing this I, I am going to invite you to think about this term compassion um, and so before I go into that though I just want you to imagine um, for a moment because if you think about it, we've talked a lot about the perspectives of nurses um, and how we practice and how we think about practice how we educate nurses but if you think about it, we're all consumers of healthcare. So I'm just going to invite you to imagine for a moment that you or a loved one are, ex are the ones that are experiencing physical, mental or emotional pain. And so you go to see a healthcare professional. And when you get there, that person is compassionate. And somehow you get the feeling that everything's going to be OK, that your needs are going to be see attended to, and that you're going to get the help that you need. But importantly, I also want you to think about the idea that if you go to see another healthcare professional at a different time, are you going to receive the same compassion as you experienced the first time? So I just want you to bear that in mind for a moment. <coughs> So compassion is something we've heard a lot about over the last 15 years and it's at the heart of our nursing theories in terms of the values that we think about, that we teach to, when we teach about that therapeutic use of self, we talk about compassion a lot. Um, it's integral to our professional practice guidelines and anyone who has studied on a mental health nursing course will know that it is now embedded into the NMC's professional code of conduct and probably in everyone's um, you know back shelf somewhere because they've carried it around for three to four years on that nursing course. Um, so it's actually a core value of the NHS, it's embedded into everything that the NHS does, everything the NHS stands for, they talk about compassion, all the policies talk about compassion. And then um, that last slide there was the new, the new um, core competencies framework. So the Oliver McGowan framework, compassion is central to that, central to person-centered care, everything that we do. But what is compassion really? What is it? What does it look like to you? What does it feel like? How do you know, for example, when you deliver compassion in your own professional practice, how do you know when you have received compassion. So when I asked you to think about those examples and I invited you to imagine for a moment what those experiences might be like, often when I deliver this and, I, and we get a chance to share and people share their experiences, and Jim will know this because I shared, I did a little bit of snapshot of this when I did my interview at Sheffield Hallam. Um, so people often share lots of different experiences. It might have been, they might have been the one delivering care, they might have been the person taking their family member to see a healthcare professional, they might have been, the, you know, actually going to see a GP or something. Um, and one of the common ingredients that people talk about is this idea of compassion, or the idea of a lack of compassion, that they haven't received 
that experience of compassion. Um, so how is compassion defined? So we have this now, there's a growing body of research that shows that compassion is defined as a human quality. So it's inherent to who we are. So this idea of our personal values fits in with that as well. Um, and it's, so it's got this, this two parts to it. So there's the idea of that we become, we are sensitive to the suffering of another human being and that we then take action to respond to that suffering. And anyone who's heard of Paul, Kil Paul Gilbert's work, this is another formulation of compassion that takes that one step further. So compassion is about taking that extra step to actually take action to relieve suffering and then actually do something to prevent that suffering in the future. So in the last 15 years, we've seen a growing body of research and the previous research that we've seen suggests that compassion can improve adherence to medications, which of, of course is important as practitioners. We know that that improves health outcomes. Um, it's something that gives us that sense of satisfaction as a patient. And you will know if you've been to see someone, there's a, that I haven't put this on the slide today, but there's that some, it's quite outdated now, but it's still sort of relevant in a way, the research that says that within 40 seconds, you can sort of get an idea of whether someone's going to be compassionate towards you when you walk in the door. And that really relieves our anxieties about that healthcare experience. Um, and it can improve patient well-being and health outcomes. So of course, it's very important. Who doesn't want to improve health outcomes, right? That's why we go into nursing in the first place. <laughs> But so clearly the experience of compassion is important and the growing body of research suggests that compassion is important in that experience of healthcare. But there's very little research um, about what compassion is and what it means, what the function of compassion might be, how it's defined in the context of mental health care. And that's where my research comes in. So that's where after my literature review, I'd found that there was a gap in the research all of the research, and I was lucky enough actually to go across to Canada last year as part of my PhD. I had some funding, I was lucky enough to be fully funded, um, and I had um, a research expense paid trip over to the University of Calgary, where I met um, Shane Sinclair, Professor Shane Sinclair, who is a leading researcher in the Compassion Research. Um, they've been researching it for 13 years, and they've looked at, they've done interviews with hundreds and hundreds of patients at the bedside, and all of those patients want compassion. They talk about compassion. It's clearly very, very significant. But all of the research that's been done so far has all been in palliative care and general health care settings. So actually, this context is important. We know it's important. Um, and I'm, as a mental health nurse, I, I'm similar to you. I'm very much, you know, I know what I want my practice to look like. I know what care should look like. I know how I want to deliver care. I know how I want to educate students to deliver future care. And, and I want it to be a compassionate experience for people. Um, so I had to be very careful about bringing my own um, sort of biases into it. I had to be very reflexive. Um, what, but what does it actually look like? So I had my own sense and ideas of what I, what I thought it looked like, but actually this is one of the sort of intellectual curiosities as well. So as I've been trained for about six years, seven years now. Um, so this was all sort of a big buzzword when I was training and I was thinking, you know, I'm being assessed on how compassionate I am. People are writing things in my book, um, you know, the, um, the competencies were a book then. <laughs> Um, and it was, you know, Carmel's a very compassionate practitioner with the patients, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking, but how are you assessing me on that? There's no evidence there in mental health to say how I'm being compassionate or not. And how are all these structural discourses subjectifying me as a professional? Have I become an agent of, um, you know, have I become this social agent? Am, am I being dominated by these, um, you know, all these discourses are being subjected onto me as, a, as I'm being educated? So this was sort of all this, in all the intellectual curiosity that I had led to my PhD. Um, but why is it important? So why actually do we need to think about compassion in the context of mental health care? Well, 
We've got 29.1% of a global population that over a lifetime will live with at least one clinically diagnosed mental health condition. Um, there's this idea, and it came up a lot in the results actually, in the what the patients and and the I'm sh I'm sorry I'm not sharing the mental health um, nurses part of it now because it actually really links with what you were saying um, about this you know risk versus um, and objectifying patients and thinking that about them in terms of um, you know this medical model and, um, and how we use that to then get people into services and how we treat them and how we think about what mental health is. Um, so there's this idea about over pathologizing the human experience and then there's an international agreement that actually we need to have a more relational approach to this. We need to sort of think about it in relational terms um, and how that can improve outcomes for this population. And so, excuse me. So how do we um, communicate compassion in mental health nursing? So this, this part of it is from the patient's perspectives. So from our patient's perspectives, this is what they want. Um, and, and how we communicate, it is very relational. Uh, and so, um, was it you, Neil, that talked about validation? Or was, or was it you? I can't remember. Some, somebody brought up this idea of validating the, um, the person's experience, which was very, very important for them. And for me, these things are, are very much clinical skills that we can teach in our curricula. So we need to get that more of that into um, how we sort of develop uh, future nurses to then so moving away, I think I think what we're talking about with the NMC committee has really sort of triggered my thinking in terms of how we've moved away. And I've spoken to Jim about this earlier, and we're, we're doing all this, you know, venue puncture, all the things that people aren't going to use, but actually mental health nurses are going to use these skills every single day. They're going to need to know how do I actively listen to a person? How do I then reflect that content? And how do I then understand what's really going on for them? Um, and they wanted someone who had a presence, so someone who came across as warm. And again, this is very, very new. So this is really new research. And when I went to see the people in Canada, they're talking, they're developing um, tr uh, compassion-based training sessions for professionals. And they're looking at all these con concepts and constructs because again, it's a contested concept. So I'm saying, what does compassion mean to you? But actually, what does warmth mean to you? What does it mean to be to do? to be warm with someone else? How, how do you have that experience? So again, they're developing this training, taking all these concepts that make up the idea of compassion and they're testing that in the field to then develop a training package for healthcare professionals, which I think is really exciting. Um, so they wanted uh, someone who is really calm um, and someone who un seeks to understand the person. So this linked in, so when you were in present in that relationship with them in that therapeutic sense, they wanted that um, the practitioner to have a non-judgmental approach, which I know is very, very difficult to do sometimes. Um, and they wanted to have this trauma-informed approach. So thinking about um, the patient in a way of what actually has happened to you that you are having this experience and not thinking about um, what is wrong with you. Um, so this is how the, the patients wanted um, the experience from the practitioner. And I think this is really important, again, because um, everything we do is relational. So I think for us, compassion should be a verb. It should be something that we do every day. But again, it's very, very new research and it still needs more development because this, as far as I know, my study is the only study that has looked at the patient's perspective and asked patients, what does compassion mean to you? There's some, there's a, a couple of studies out there, one by Brown at De Montford, who, um, who has looked at the mental health nurses' perspectives. But again, those patients' perspectives are completely out, out of there. Um, so it's, it's in everything that we do. And there's an opportunity for compassion to flow in that, in that, not just in that therapeutic relationship, but in our everyday interactions that we have with patients. But sadly, not everyone, as you can imagine, experienced um, compassion. Uh, the, what I showed you on the slide there was 
in a sense, a lot of patient, a lot of the participants that I, uh, the patient participants that I spoke to, talked about this in in a very hypothetical sense because a lot of their experiences were were not compassionate. Um, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Um, so a lot of them talked about um, this idea that you were just talking about, Jenny, before I started about this idea of the system. Um, and the, the rationalities within that system that healthcare professionals take upon themselves as a profession. You know, we, we have all these structures, we have all these policies that we work under and we have to work within those policies. But that was very limiting in terms of the decision making that practitioners take to actually, which was sort of antithetical to this idea of compassion that the patients wanted to experience. And so they talked about the services were difficult to access and, and I haven't used those absolutely tons and tons of data which would be really interesting to talk to you about Neil in terms I've still got loads of data left that I don't know what to do with that I haven't published and I, I've got this idea in my head about the systems versus professionals um, so there's this idea of the structure that's there that actually makes um, the system really difficult to access and so there, there was this, 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 this constant discourse coming up about um, being, t being given these labels, attention seeking, being made to feel like a nuisance. So this is just like really snapshots of the, of the data that I have. Um, and the, there was a, this idea that patients were made to feel uh, stigmatized by the system because they were referred to like, some of the p participants had made an access request and, been, and got their notes and found that they'd been referred to as uncompliant, as made to feel like in terms of, so one participant said that they'd, the person that they saw, um, a community mental health nurse, had actually told them that, that they had a problem with their brain, that there was something wrong with them. So again, it's that discourse linked to that medical model um, Oh, it's there, sorry. Um, and then there was this idea of discredited or marginalised voices. So this particular participant, and you get this, you have this really strong image when you've done research, and there is this idea of researcher distress, I think, that comes out as well, because you have these images of, of the participants. I don't know how you feel about this, sorry, but it sticks with me. And, and certain participants, I can remember them all, and I remember the conversation I've had with them. And this particular person uh, had been in services for about 30 years, and they had an eating disorder. They, they, um, formulated their distress as complex um, and that made it very difficult to them in terms of the way that they presented themselves to services which was very much um, incongruent with how they were feeling, how they felt so much pain. They said it was such a painful life to live, the world was a painful place to be in, services was painful to, to be a part of. But when they needed help, they were told they didn't present in a certain way to be a part of that service. So they talked about feeling gaslit. They were gaslit every time they went to speak to somebody. So they said, oh, well, you, you don't look, you don't present how, you, how you're saying you're feeling sort of thing. And it was like, but I am telling you I feel like that and you're discrediting what I'm saying to you. Um, so there was a lot of feeling, feeling marginalized from services. Um, and then another person told me that they, had, um, you know, they were very, very intent on following their suicide plan. They'd already uh, been dragged out of a, um, a, a body of water. I can't remember the exact words that they said. Uh, they'd been dragged out of a body of water. They'd already um, been seen by crisis services being sent home, and they were still uh, intent on following their suicide plan. But they felt like they, they weren't believed. So again, I wonder if it fits with this idea of risk and it's not something that I've really explored, but I know that I'm aware that it's in the data. Um, um, so patients want compassion, but so what? Um, uh, and these are the findings from my study. So, um, you know, it d the idea of mobilizing hope is really important in mental health services um, because when, the, when there was an absence of compassion, um, 
it had a really serious negative impact on people and, and one participant in particular told me that they felt so suicidal they went to see a healthcare professional and they were told you know go away there's nothing we can do and they took an overdose and they didn't seek help for that because they thought it's no point being on this earth anymore because no one cares um, so actually, you know, it can have a the absence of compassion has a really serious impact on people. And I can hear you saying compassion's always been in nursing, hasn't it? But actually, I, I spoke to this lady here, uh, Sarah Cheney, so she works for the RCN and she's done a postdoctoral study on the emotions um, in nursing. And she went back to the interwar period and, and looked at actually the idea of compassion isn't actually there until we hit like the Francis reports and the Berwick review and all the other things and then there was a massive discourse on compassion that's this turning point in the discourse um, so actually these revisions in the in the NMC code have come about because of the sh structural and policy the policy impact so how do we stay focused on compassion well we need to think about be being compassionate to ourselves um, Otherwise, we won't be able to continue to champion compassion in nursing. It's very challenging. We've got these very demanding environments with increasing uh, demands and less resources. Um, and there's evidence that practicing self-compassion, I know Shane Sinclair would say it doesn't exist because he doesn't believe in it. Um, it moderates burnout. And so I just want, before we go, I know we've been talking a lot about other people's health and health generally, but how do we, um, stay healthy uh, and uh, you know how do we maintain our own sense of well-being so I'll just quickly go through this because I know I'm running out of time so I like to say this idea and I know it's it's the same for us as academics as well and as researchers you know we our, our minds can get so busy I'm probably probably teaching you to suck eggs here Jim our minds can get so busy and full I imagine it being like a snow globe and we've got 101 emails to do and we're busy and the kids need to go out for, to school or whatever um, but it's just thinking about you know how do we then sort of slow all that down and so I want you to invite you to think about what what you're going to take home to say how can I sort of you know manage my own um, stress levels and be compassionate to myself what can I do I know I, I sort of, I meditate every night, so that's my thing, to settle my mind at night. Uh, thank you. Thank yeah? You. Don't, don't take oh. back so long yet. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was so lovely. <laughs> for yourself. <laughs> Mm. Uh, that's a question that holds hope for me when I can't hold my own hope. 
Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry you've had a really horrible experience. You know, you've had ho those horrible experiences as well. Um, and a lot of the service users, or the patient, I, well, I, talk, I call them patient participants in my research because that's what they wanted to be referred to because they said, you know, we're not service users beca because we can't use the bloody services half the time anyway. So, <laughs> what we, and, and you know, I, if, if, I go to see, if I go to see a doctor for a physical health problem, I'm called a patient then, so I can be a patient now. I want to be called patient, so um, so that's why I talked to about patient participants, and, and because when I was writing, it was easier because I had the chapter on nurse um, participants and patient participants. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting, and actually everyone I spoke to, so that's why everyone's faces just stick with me in my head because they all said, you know, this is so important. Why isn't there any research on this? This is what we want. This is the most important thing to us. I just want somebody to sit with me and be kind to me because that just makes me. F it, you get that feeling, you know, that that you're gonna get the hope that you, and it's nice. It makes you feel cared for, and and um part of I didn't put this up today but I've shared it in the past and I'm happy to share today you know um, my daughter is 25 now and she has chronic depression she has physical health problems so we've been physical and mental health side and we've experienced I've been with her um, and when she's been receiving care on both sides and we've experienced a lack of compassion from both sides and and sort of this sort of it was one of my influences as well so I've got academic and personal influences and you know we've often had this uh, conversation about compassion when we've come out from those, um, you know, those appointments. And she said to me, "Mom, this this is it makes such a big difference to my ha how I experience care. You know, it's not just about doing things. It's about sometimes it's just about that person doesn't have to do anything if they've got that presence and that warmth." And they're just giving you a lovely smile. That can that can be compassionate. Can make all that difference. Yeah. So sometimes it, it could be about sort of not not having that action. You know, not thinking about what can I do. I had this conversation because I delivered it to the third year um, mental health students last week, and we had this big conversation about you know because again it comes out in the in the data about this idea of systems versus professionals and. And they were saying, you know, what is an organisation? Is it the policies? Is it the structures? Is it the spaces? Is it actually the individual people that make up that organisation? You know, but actually, then there's that, there's this idea of we need to know more as an individual within an organisation. When we're with a person, we need to be able to have those skills and know well what what is active listening? How do I? How do I, I mean, I mean, I know you'll uh, be with me on this, Amy, but I think we were really taught all these skills, weren't were we not? About how, yeah, compassion focused training and how to interview a person, how to be with that person in that interview, how to demonstrate that warmth and that compassion within that therapeutic relationship. Not just delivering a lecture on what, well, what is the therapeutic relationship? What does it mean? But actually practicing that in a safe space, um, and this is what the, they wanted more of this. They wanted more of this idea of 
not just doing a role play of, or not just doing a how to do a um, cannulation or whatever. They wanted to actually build up those nursing, mental health nursing skills, which are, do have those compassionate values attached to them. And so that sort of really resonated with me, but I don't, I don't, I don't think, I think we've, I think we've taken a step away from that, if anything, with the new competencies. I don't know, I'm just ranting now anyway, I'm going, <laughs> sorry. I've got about four minutes left questions, and a lot of people want to ask you questions, so shall we go to Mark? Yeah, I think, I think, to be fair, I think um, a lot of what, what Jim was saying, what Jim was saying, now what you've just said, you've sort of, it was more of a comment, really, and I think you, between you've sort of summarised what I was going to say anyway. Um, but I, I know um, that I was looking initially to, you know, what, what compassion, compassionate care looked like within the um, structures of home treatment, within the confines of home treatment, um, and came out with something completely different. But maybe it's not so much different, maybe it's around those are the barriers yeah responses yeah and um and i yeah you know i said that about paul gilbert's books uh, it some of the stuff that he was saying there by shane sinclair about some of those i can see mm. you know you've got some stuff by helen spangler on there and uh, I've, I've got all of that stuff and i was reading all that stuff I, I suppose from my point of view you were talking about compassion only just now being put into the standards but I think it's always been there. It's just the, it's the difficulty in defining what that is. Mm. How do we measure that? And that's the problem, I think, that the NMC have, isn't it, in terms of the yeah. and not really understanding what we do as mental health nurses. It's mm. very difficult to define. And it's yeah. just a comment around that more than yeah. um, in terms of how do we define compassion. And um, we talk about, I think we talk to self, we talk about being with clients again, another sort of phenomenological. Um, idea, but um, just being with somebody, you know, holding somebody's hand at three o'clock in the morning, mm. in A&E. Um, I once got told off for putting in the paper um, by one of the peer reviewers. We don't hold hands in A&E, but I, I meant metaphorically. You know, that's what we do as mental health nurses, mm. don't we? It's that therapeutic use of self. It's that support. It's that being with the individual, and and it's difficult to define. So I think this is really yeah. valuable research to identify what sort of compassion is and what people want from mental health care. I think, again, that's something that hopefully will inform our understanding and maybe move us towards better sort of nurse education in the future mm. for mental health nurses. Thank you. <laughs>